We just give him an ovation of praise across this place today. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus today. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus today. Amen. 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 Well, I don't know if you can, but if you can, feel free to be seated in the presence of the Lord today. Worship team, thank you so much for guiding us into the presence of the Lord today. What a joy it is to be here with you and to be caught up into the presence of the Lord together. I have the great opportunity to be in many churches. Uh, every, every week, almost, almost, I'm at a different church. And I can assure you that you truly are blessed to be able to come together and worship in this environment and to be led by the people that are leading you here this morning. In fact, why don't you honor them and tell them how much you love them today? Thank you so much, worship team. Well, I, I'm not sure uh, what to say about that introduction other than to say that if I were to tell stories about your pastor's rap and hip-hop days, I would have to, uh, I'd probably have to confess my own indiscretions. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid that this morning. But uh, it is such a joy uh, to be able to be here with you. Lynette and I uh, just are uh, blown away. Uh, by this congregation. Uh, this is the first opportunity that we've had to be with you in any capacity, and it is such a joy to see what the Lord is doing here in Huntsville. Amen? And what he's doing here at Life Church. Uh, your pastors were so kind enough to show us around last evening and to see all that the Lord is doing and this wonderful facility that he's given you and how you're utilizing it to expand the influence of the kingdom. Man, it truly is inspiring. And you know, the truth is that as you look around, uh, you might not see it some days because you're here every week, but from those of us who are coming in from the outside looking in, we can witness in our spirit that you have just touched the tip of what the Lord wants you to do uh, here in Huntsville, extending the influence of the kingdom of God. And I want to uh, just say that we rejoice with you and we're so thankful uh, for the warm welcome and the hospitality uh, that you have extended to us uh, here today. I, I really can't say enough about your pastors. Uh, Pastor Kevin and Amy are dear friends of ours, and we have had uh, opportunities through the last uh, how many years uh, to intersect our paths and to have opportunities to fellowship together. And what we know about your pastors is that they are the kind of people that you want to know. They're the kind of people you want to be in relationship with, and they're the kind of people that you can trust to share with you the word of the Lord and to lead you into the seasons that God has for you. And so I really think that it would be appropriate for you to honor them today and tell them how much that you love them and appreciate their leadership. I do owe you an additional thanks as a church that you lent them to us uh, now two years ago uh, to Minnesota uh, to be a part of our very first uh, summer camp meeting in Minnesota. Uh, Pastor Kevin and Amy both came and ministered the Word of God and left an indelible mark upon the people of the Minnesota Church of God. And it was just such a wonderful time of ministry and fellowship. And I want to thank you as a congregation for sending them and for giving them the opportunity not only to touch the Minnesota Church of God family, but to touch many other congregations and many other states uh, as they travel uh, and do ministry. We, we observe them and pray for them as we see the opportunities in the doors that the Lord opens for them. And so it, it truly is a, uh, a joy to watch that. And I want to thank you as a congregation for lending them to us because it, it put a lot of change in my pocket as a rookie bishop in, Minis in Minnesota. <laughs> Uh, so it really uh, blessed me. Uh, it's also great to see uh, uh, Jason uh, Halcox and his family. We had the opportunity to worship together for a season of time at City Church in Chattanooga when we were living in Cleveland and they were serving there. And so it's, it's a joy to be here with you all and to be able to worship with you today as well. Well, you have been in a series which I truly uh, appreciate. A back to the Bible series, and this morning we're going to do our best to conclude that. Now, the trouble with coming in at the end of a series is all the good messages have been preached and all the good preachers have preached already. 
So you're just going to have to help me out this morning. Amen. But uh, just as we get started this morning, would you take your Bibles, and I think this would be appropriate for this series, let's make a confession of faith about what you have in your hand. So if you have a written Bible or, or you have an, a, a digital Bible, why don't you take it in your hand and lift it up, and I want you to say this after me. It'll help me be a little more comfortable, and it'll help us all to understand what it is that we are turning to today. Let's say it together, this is my Bible. Oh, I think we can do better than that in Huntsville. This is my Bible. This is the inspired, infallible, indestructible Word of God. I believe what it says. I am who it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. I will gladly receive and obey. Is truth without offense. And I'll never, ever be the same again. Praise the Lord. Now give the Lord an ovation for his word this morning. I thank the Lord for the word of God. Amen? Amen. From the mid-1800s to the late 1800s, one of the most influential ministers of the gospel in Illinois, the areas of Chicago and Northfield and in the UK as well, was known by the name of Dwight L. Moody. You might be familiar with that last name, Moody, because you have Moody Bible Institute and Moody Bible Church and the Moody Radio Network and a lot of other Moody things. They're all named after him because of the extent of his influence. He was a passionate preacher of the gospel, and and he saw many people saved, and he, he... trained young men and young women for ministry and had a dedication to raise up people to preach the gospel and to go forward and to extend the influence of the kingdom. He built a great church in Chicago. He was a pastor there during the great Chicago fire that we all learned about in the history books in school. He was a fantastic man of God and a great minister of the gospel. One time he went to England on one of his ministry journeys and he was preaching there and he came across a young minister named Henry Morehouse. And Henry Morehouse was uh, enthralled by uh, Dwight L. Moody's ministry and introduced himself as a young minister of the gospel and as many pastors do from time to time, said, well, if you're ever in Chicago thinking it would never happen, come by and we'll let you preach at Moody Church, I don't think it was called then then. So he forgot about this and time went by until he was surprised one day when he got a telegram from this young preacher. The young preacher said, I'm going to be in Chicago this week and I look forward to preaching at your church this Sunday. Well, that took Brother Moody by surprise, but it just so happened that he was going to be out of town that weekend. And so he said, well... Since I invited him and since he's coming and since I'm not going to be here anyway, I'll let him preach this Sunday and we'll see how he does. Can't be too bad after all. It's just one day. So he goes and does his ministry and young Morehouse preaches on that Sunday. And when Dwight Moody comes back in town, he asks his wife, says, well, I've been away. How did the young man do? This was before internet. This was before live streaming. This is before all of those things where people post how great a sermon was. In fact, if you want to post that today, it won't hurt my feelings. <laughs> His wife said he's been doing great. He, in fact, he preaches better than you. Now, I want to tell you, as a preacher of the gospel, when your wife tells you somebody preaches better than you, it cuts right to the core. He's preaching better than you. What do you mean? He said, Well, he actually tells sinners that God loves them. Dwight steps back and says, what are you talking about? God hates sin. It's wrong for him to be saying those things. Where is he at? Well, he's still down at your church preaching. He's been preaching there every night. And they've been filling the auditorium. And he's only preaching on one verse. And he's telling people, that God loves them. Moody said, well, I've got to see this. So he goes down and he sits in the back row and 
he listens to the young man break open the word of God talking about John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. The young man told the people that were gathered there that God did in fact hate the sin, but he loved them. That he was there to forgive them and that he was there to reach them with his grace, his mercy, his compassion, and his love. And as Moody sat there, his heart was convicted. And he got a fresh revelation of the essence of who God is. He got a fresh revelation of why it was that he was, do, he was called to do what he was called to do. And from that moment forward, he had a fresh understanding of the love of God, and it transformed his ministry going forward. John 3, 16, a simple verse, 26 words. Some call it the alphabet of grace. It's perhaps the most memorized verse in all of the Bible. Simple yet incredibly profound because it reveals to us the heart of the God that we've gathered here to worship this morning. Because when you peel back all of, all of the window dressing and when you peel back all the layers of teaching and when you, you peel back all of the things that we do and you look deep into the heart of this God that we serve, you're going to find but one thing. And that one thing is pure love. Because in the heart of God, you'll discover that he has a love for every single one of his creations. There's not been a person that has ever drawn breath on this planet, nor shall ever draw breath in this planet that was not an object of the love of God. Because he is pure love. 1 John 4, 8 tells us that, doesn't it? God is love. Perhaps one of the greatest Christian writers of all time, C.S. Lewis, wrote it this way. He loved us not because we were lovable, but because he is love. For God so loved the world that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish, but have everlasting life. This word world in the original language is the Greek word cosmos, which means this to us here this morning. It can be defined this way, the ungodly multitude, the whole mass of men alienated from God and therefore hostile to the cause of Christ. In other words, God so loved a creation that so despised him that they chose their way over his way. He so loved that creation that he gave himself for them in death. Now that is love. You've been in this series, Back to the Bible, and I want to draw your attention to what I believe is one of the clearest revelations of this love that you'll find in all of the scriptures. I want to draw your attention to John chapter 4. If you have your Bibles there, turn with me there in the Gospel of John chapter 4. And we'll find there a return to a place. A place that's located in central Israel, just to the east in the valley that lies between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Just about a mile and a half east of the ancient city of Shechem, about a half a mile south of a village called Sychar, a place where there was a well. I'm going to invite you for the next few moments to return with me there to Jacob's well. A famous place. If you look back in, in the scriptures, there's not a lot of reference directly to Jacob's well, only that it was located in the, the land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and not far from there is Joseph's tomb. But if you read throughout the, the history of the Old Testament and the God's dealings with people, a lot of important things happened in this area. A lot of important things occurred, and God met people there frequently and did profound things. And in John chapter 4, the Son of God met an individual there and did profound things in that one individual's lives. John chapter 4, we're going to begin today at verse 4 as we return 
to the well. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me to drink? And Jesus said to her, Will you give me to drink? I said that twice, didn't I? Let me go on. Verse 8. His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her and said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give to them will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty again and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now, when you read this story on first glance, it, it's interesting. If you, if you follow off the rest of the story, and perhaps you've read it this week as part of your back to the Bible commitment. And so you, as you read this, you understand what happens after this. Jesus encounters the woman and tells her about her life, and she responds to him, and she ends up receiving from him the gift of forgiveness. Her life is transformed. In this moment, Jesus does some profound things. He, he confronts restrictive social conventions. He gives hope to an outcast Samaritan woman. And he transforms an entire village. We'll get to all of those things in just a moment. When you look at this on the surface, you might not see this as a controversial story. But in reality, this love that Jesus had in his heart for this woman confronted some very strong restrictive conventions that turned society really and religious opinion on its ear. You need to understand that when this verse begins in verse 4 that says that Jesus had to go through Samaria, that was something that was not done frequently by Jews. You might say, why? Because the route from Jerusalem to get the, the Galilee in a straight line runs right through there. It's the shortest distance. It's about a two-mile or two-day journey on a straight line. But if you go around Samaria, it probably takes you up to a week. So it's four to five days shorter to go through Samaria than to go around Samaria. But Jews didn't often take the direct route because they considered Samaritans to be a racially inferior people. Samaritans were a mixed race in their mind. And there was a racial barrier here that kept the Jews from going through there. This verse said that Jesus needed to go through there. Why did he need to go through there? Because he was on a mission to break down racial barriers, to share the love of God with all who needed to see it and to receive it. You see, the love of God knows no barrier of race or ethnicity or culture. The love of God is given to whosoever. Remember that in John 3? Whosoever will. The whosoever has involved all of us. And at some point in, in history, all of us have been on the, the downside of someone's prejudice. We're in a season of time now when a lot of things are being said about race. A lot, of, a lot of words are being thrown around, and there are a lot of people on the opposite sides of those issues. I want to say to you this morning that the, that the love of God knows no barrier as it relates to race, and if the love of God knows no barrier as it relates to race, then our love for others should also know no barrier as it relates to race. 
because every single one of us are created in the image of a living God, a God who loves us each and every one to the very depth of our being. So I want to encourage you today to see that Jesus went out of his way in this instance to teach us a lesson about his love. To tear down the barriers that men try to construct to divide us. Because remember what Jesus said? It wasn't Abraham that said it. Abraham Lincoln that said it first. Jesus did a house divided against itself. Cannot stand. The chief and I don't really want to wade too deep in here, but I feel led. The chief work and strategy of the enemy is division. And when he can, he sows that division. Because when there's division, there can't be God's blessing upon the vision. And God's vision is that all of us would be saved, healed, delivered, set free, united, and empowered in one body, extending his influence and glorifying his name. Hallelujah. And so it's the love of God received in our hearts that overflows to those that are different than ourselves. You cannot defeat the divisions of men by the force of your will. It is a work of the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts, pouring out his love in us and overflowing that love to others. And so I pray, and I know that it is because I look around this place, and it's a wonderfully diverse congregation, that this place would be a place that would declare in the Huntsville and greater area that there is no Jew nor Greek, no male nor free, no black nor white, no, no Hispanic, nor, no, nor European, nor Australian, nor American, but we are all one in Jesus Christ. Because that's the message of Jesus in John chapter 4 when he went through Samaria and taught his disciples this thing. We will not subject the mission of the Father to the prejudices of men. So he tore down racial barriers. But he didn't just tear down racial barriers. He tore down religious barriers. Because the Samaritans had a syncretic faith, not a pure faith like the Jews had. They had borrowed from Jewish tradition. They had borrowed from pagan tradition. And they were doing their own thing in Samaria, conducting their own kind of worship. And the Jews considered them impure as a result of it. And so they felt superior to the Samaritans. And so they wouldn't have inner dealings with them because not only of their racial prejudice, but because of their sense of pride about their own religious purity. So when Jesus goes through and begins to engage a Samaritan woman, you see quickly that she turns the congregation con con conversation and says to him, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain. But you Jews say we got to worship in Israel, down in Jerusalem. Jesus says, I tell you, there's a day that's coming. The place won't be important, the heart will be. Because God's not looking for people that are going to deify a place. He's looking for people that's going to deal, that they're going to worship God in spirit and in truth, irregardless of geography. In purity of heart. And so the love of God is tearing down the religious barriers that were constructed that would have prevented this woman from ever hearing that truth. Now, uh, you know. I don't know why I have to meddle sometimes when I preach, but, but I preach in some churches, and this isn't one, I'm sure, but I preach in some churches sometimes 
where people get a little bit of religious spirit on them and they start looking down on other people because they, you know, do it different than we do. Different stylistically, different geographically, different methodologically, whatever you might want to, whatever the difference is, we find any number of ways to draw differences and distinctions to make ourselves feel better. I'm here to say to you something today. The love of God calls us not only to go beyond racial divisions and barriers, but to go beyond religious divisions and barriers. That's not to say that we at all in any way sacrifice the truth of our faith nor, nor the, 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 the integrity of this word. Now, I'm not suggesting that in any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I'm suggesting that we don't allow our religious prejudices to keep us from sharing the truth and the fidelity of this word with people who don't understand it yet. And that's what Jesus was doing, see. He wasn't endorsing their worship at the mountain or their syncretic faith. He was simply saying there's coming a day when traveling Jerusalem is not going to be the key thing. What's going to, happen, what's going to matter more is that you understand who God is and that you worship him in spirit and truth from your heart in the right way and the right motive. And so I'm suggesting today that, that we tear down religious barriers that keep us from bridging into other communities of faith and say this is, in fact, the word of the living God. It is infallible. It is inspired. It does hold the truth. Sure, we look different, and sure, we worship different, and sure, we do things differently, but in Jesus' name, we are worshiping together in spirit and in truth, and we are one body united in Christ Jesus, empowered by his faith. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism in which we all live and move to have our being. Hallelujah. It's okay. I'll be back in Minnesota in a couple of days. You won't have to mess with me anymore. Forgive me for meddling just a little bit. I just want to share with you what the Lord has laid on my heart. We cannot allow barriers that are of man-made construction to keep us from uniting with people of like faith, whether or not they're different than us or not. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pat myself on the back later for saying it. Amen. The third thing I want you to see here is that he not only tore down racial barriers, he not only tore down uh, religious barriers, he tore down social conventions. Now this was perhaps the most scandalous of everything that he did. He had the temerity to address a woman. To speak to her outside the presence of anyone else. Now, it was, in fact, a violation of the Talmud, the religious oral tradition of the Jews for a rabbi whom Jesus was to address a woman in this way. He was absolutely violating the social conventions. Not only the social convention, but this, this woman was not just any woman, she was a scandalous woman. If you read on in John 4, you find that she's had five husbands and she's cohabitating with another man. That's why she's there at the sixth hour of the day and not earlier. She's there in the heat of the day at noon, not early in the morning when all the other women would come from the village to gather water. Why? Because the well was a place of ridicule for this woman. If she was to come in the middle part of the day, the other women of the town would ridicule her and, and would cause her to feel more and more like an outcast. They wouldn't welcome her. They would, they would relegate her to the edges and, and ridicule her. So she returned to the well in the middle part of the day, hoping that she would find no one and hoping upon hope that she would find someone. Her life was miserable. She'd been wounded and used and betrayed. She'd been bruised and, 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 and uh, 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 abused. She'd been treated like nothing. And, and her self-worth had to be lower than low. She's coming out. One more time, returning to the well, because she had to do it every day because that's the way that that worked back then. You had to go to the well every day to get water for the day. And so she's going, 
she's going down that path thinking to myself, well, I hope there's nobody there. I hope there's nobody there. I, I, I really don't, I just don't want to see anybody today. And then she gets there and finds a Jewish man sitting there, a rabbi at that. And he had the temerity to address her. Tearing down the social conventions that devalued women and falsely elevated the value of men. I want to share with you something here today. Men are not more valuable than women. Women are not less valuable than men. But we are created equally in the image of the Almighty God. And we are equally qualified to receive the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. Regardless of our gender, regardless of our past. There is nothing that can, that can keep us from being able to access this infinite, limitless, all-encompassing love that seeks us out like the song sang earlier, blows into our life like a hurricane force wind. And reveals itself to us. And this is what Jesus was showing to his disciples. Because in verse 27 you'll find when they came back they saw that Jesus wasn't resting as they supposed that he would be. But in fact he was engaging a Samaritan woman and they were shocked. It says they were surprised. They said, looked at one another. You see what I'm seeing? We can't leave him alone for five minutes. <laughs> this guy over here, what's wrong with him? Doesn't he know that's a woman and a Samaritan woman at that? In fact, they were, there were some rumors about a woman like that in the town when we were there. But you know what they did? We better not say anything. Because we've said some stuff before. Even Peter held his tongue. What was Jesus doing? He was going after the outcast. He was going after the lost. He was going after the one sheep that was outside of the fold. And he was demonstrating with a powerful illustration to his disciples, we will not withhold this love, this love of the Father from a stranger, a foreigner, or a woman. Pastor, why in the world does the Lord ask me to speak this here today? All I can say is he's speaking to me. And I hope he's speaking to you that the love of God breaks down every barrier. And if the love of God breaks down any barrier, who are we to build any new ones? There's not a one of us perfect in this. There's not a one of us perfect in this. So we are all subject to the challenge today to follow the, the example of Jesus at the well. To break down barriers. Because the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, that's the first part. That's a challenge. Here's an encouragement. Not only are we challenged not to build barriers and to let the love of God break them down, but we're also, it's also, this also reveals to us that none of us are beyond the reach of this love. You know, you got a pastor that used to listen to Belle Biv DeVoe. I mean, come on. I mean, come on. <laughs> that just tickles my heart. <laughs> now, here's the deal. We've all got things in our past that we're ashamed of. Little things that we are happy to make light of and bigger things that we would dare not say. There's not a person in this room that doesn't have those, one of those things sitting back there somewhere. You might be sitting here today thinking, 
I expected the roof to fall in when I walked in this church this morning. I had, I had no idea that I would make it this far without lightning striking. This illustrated sermon that Jesus put on here in John chapter 4 is a revelation to you and to me of this truth. There's not one, not one that is beyond his love. And there's not so bad a case that he cannot rescue. Think about what happens here. Jesus says to this woman, he has the temerity to say, would you give me a drink? <laughs> she looks at him and says, <laughs> give you a drink. I'll give you something else. You don't have anything to draw with. Why should I give you a drink? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. What are you doing? Don't you know I'm the low of the low? You're the high of the high. You're not supposed to have anything to do with me. That's the way many of us feel about God. You heard a song earlier talking about how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. I'll bet you there are a few of you here that when that song began to play and the, and the lyrics began to came, that something in your heart rose up and said, how could he love me? You've been told you're unlovable. Somebody's treated you worse than you should have been treated. Maybe you've treated somebody else worse than they should be treated. Maybe you've done some things that made you feel down in here or other people have done some things that made you feel down here. And when the songs are sung and the, the preacher preaches and the smiles are shared and the testimonies are going forth, you sit back there and you say, that's great for everybody else, but God couldn't love me. I'm here to tell you today that God loves you. Jesus went out of his way to go to that well to meet that woman to tell you that he loves you. He was after her, but he wasn't just after her. He was after you. He sent me here today to let you know he loves you. If you're looking for a sign, hello, here I am, all the way from Minneapolis to tell you that God loves you. Maybe you made a mistake this week that you're terribly remorseful over. And the enemy is saying you, that's the end of it for you. I'm here to say, you're still drawing breath. The end has not come. God has given you the grace to be here this morning to receive the touch of his anointing so that you can know that he loves you. There is no hole so deep he cannot reach you there. There is no bondage so great that he cannot set you free from it. There is nothing that you have done in your past that he can't forgive you of. The Lord God Almighty will do it by his grace, by his mercy, by his power, and by his limitless love. Lest you feel a little high and mighty about now, let me tell you, there is nothing you have ever done in your life as good as you have been to ever earn this love. Your righteousness is as filthy rags before him. You might consider yourself good in comparison to other men, but there is no man that is good save Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the only one that is good. If you think you're good, you're, 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 you are comparing yourself to the wrong standard. He's the standard, not your neighbor. I've been tempted at times when I've failed to look around and say, well, at least I didn't do that. Well, Jesus did none of it. He's the righteous one. That's why he died for you. That's why he gave his life for you. That's why he had to come. That's why he stretched his arms wide upon a cross. That's why he let them willingly drive a spear into his side. That's why he looked down upon those that were gambling over his clothes and said, forgive them, Father. They know no what they do. 
That's why he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, it is finished. That's why he was willing to have his body laying in a borrowed tomb for three days. But that's why on the morning of that third day, the spirit of the living God energized that body one more time and he defeated death, hell, and the grave. Why did he do it? Because he loved you. He didn't need to do it. He didn't have to do it. Nobody compelled him to do it. He did it because he loved you. And he wanted to demonstrate to all of creation just how good he was. Ooh, hallelujah. I'm here to tell you today, God loves you. There's nothing that you've ever done that is too terrible for his love. The woman looks at Jesus when he says, I'll give you water that you'll never thirst again. She says, oh, please. Please just give me that water because I, I don't ever want to have to come back here again. I, I don't want to ever. I, I, I'd just soon never go outside my house again if you just give me that. Some of you might have felt that way at times in your life. Maybe you feel that way today. And somebody got you here to this church. It's by the grace of God that you're here, I'm here to tell you today. There's some water for you. There's some water for you at the well of Jesus. There is a fountain that's filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel, Emmanuel's veins that all who are plunged beneath the flood removes all, they lose all their guilty stains. There's some water for you. Because he loves you. Now, here's the thing. When he gives you the water, it doesn't just remove your need to go to the well. See, she was looking for something that would cause her to have to escape the ridicule. What happened was complete transformation. You see, when the love of God comes... And washes over your life and cleanses you of the guilty stains of your sin. The shame of that sin begins to fade in light of the glory of his forgiveness. And what happened for her is that in that moment she was no longer afraid to encounter her fellow neighbors. In fact, if you'll read John 4, it says that she left the well, didn't go home, she went to the village and began to declare in the streets, come meet the man who told me all that I ever did. Now, listen to that. She's ashamed of all she ever did. But now she's saying, come meet the man who told me about it, who declared my secrets to me. And forgave me all the more. Come meet him. He's the Messiah. He told me he was. Transformation occurred. Now, <laughs> this is the beauty of the church. Because this is God's design. He saves us because he loves us. But then because he saves us, he wants to use us to save other people. Now, if we never witness, he'd still love us. But when you're saved to the uttermost and you're transformed by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, how can you stay silent? How can I not tell people that when I have failed, he has lifted me up? How can I not tell people that when I was unable to remove the sin and the guilt and the shame from my own heart and from my own life. He came. He came when everyone else was gone. He met me alone at a well somewhere, and he poured out his love into my life. I encountered a God whose love was greater than anything I'd ever encountered before. How can I not tell somebody about that? And if I have closed my mouth on my testimony, I need to revisit the goodness of that love. 
Because I need a revival of that experience. I need a a fresh encounter so that it awakens in me the desire to share this goodness with other people. Jesus broke down the social conventions. He broke down the racial barriers. He tore down the religious prejudices. He transformed a woman's life, and then he saved an entire village because they came to the well with her. Up until that day, she'd been coming day after day, week after week, month after month, perhaps year after year, at the 12th hour of the day, alone to the well. She returned there day after day by herself, hoping that no one else would come. But on this day, she came back to the well. She returned to the well, but she didn't come by herself. She brought as many as would come with her because she was so grateful about what had happened in her life and so joyous to share it with other people. And they came, and they kept coming, and they kept coming, and they kept coming, and they kept coming, and they kept coming. coming. Why? Because they found the same water that she found. They found the same love that she found. They found the same forgiveness that, that she found. And the whole city was changed. That sounds a little bit like Acts chapter 2, verse 47, when it says, And God added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see, this is God's design, that he so forgive you and you so energize you by his spirit that you, going from this place, share that goodness and that love with everybody in the sphere of your influence. And as you are going every single day, God is adding to the number daily those who are being saved. The sister said, it's coming, it's coming if you'll share the love of Jesus Christ. The sister said, it's coming because God wants to use you to reach a community for him. It's coming because God has already come to you. Hallelujah. My God have mercy. If the church would be the church. If we'd be the fountain of love to the world, we wouldn't have government officials fighting about all the nonsense they fight about. Because the press would be covering us. Because the drug addicts would be coming out of the boroughs. The gangs would be laying down their their weapons. The school shootings would begin to stop. The mental health crisis in our nation would begin to be healed. Families would begin to be restored. The foundations of society would begin to be rebuilt. You see, and then the shift would turn. We're never supposed to be relying upon a a governing authority to do this kind of work. This is the work of the kingdom of God. If we'll be like Jesus and start meeting people at wells, villages will be changed. Your neighborhood will be changed. Your school will be changed. Your workplace will be changed. Your family will be changed. Sons and daughters will be saved. Grandsons and daughters will be saved. Parents will be saved. People will be delivered from all kinds of lifestyle issues and sins and bondages. Let's not water it down. Because the love of God is greater. The love of God is greater. The love of God is greater. But we have to return. We have to return there. Return to the place of our encounter with God. That he might fill our lives afresh and anew. I've got to quit. I've got to quit. Somebody argue with me. I'm I'm waiting for somebody to argue with me. Nobody's arguing with you. I guess I better quit. Years ago, there was a young man who had a terrible, terrible fight with his father. We've seen these kinds of things happen. He was of an age where he could leave home, and so he left home, and he was gone for many years. But he kept in touch with his mother from time to time. And one year, one Christmas, he wanted to come home, but he was afraid that he couldn't because his father wouldn't allow him to. He wanted to come and see his mother and see his family, but he was, he was so afraid. So he sent word to his mother and he said, I'd like to come home, but I just don't know what to do. And the mother wrote him back and said she would talk to the father. And if the father had forgiven him, when he came down the street, there would be a white ribbon tied on the limb of the tree in the front yard. And if you see the white ribbon, then you know the father has forgiven you and 
you can come home for Christmas. So he boarded a train and he began home. As he got closer, he got more nervous and he got off at the train station and he began to walk toward the house. He began to trod down those familiar streets. He turned down the corner toward his house and he was afraid to look. He looked down at his feet until he got close enough to where he knew he was right in front of his house. But he didn't want to look because he was afraid his heart would be broken. But when he looked up, he opened his eyes and he saw something he couldn't believe. There was a white ribbon tied upon every branch of the tree. Every branch had a white ribbon on it because his father didn't want him to make any mistake. All was forgiven, and he was welcome to come home. We have so many deceptive lies in our head that keep us from returning to the place of the Father's love. We have so many things that keep us in fear and bondage and prevent us from going down that path and returning to where we are most welcome and can find healing and hope for our lives. I'm here to tell you today, there's a white ribbon on a tree called Calvary. Jesus died there to let you know It's okay to come home. You can be forgiven. In fact, you already are if you'll just believe. For God so loved the world. If someone could come play for me. If God so loved the world that he he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe. Perhaps the scariest thing that woman did that day was to believe that Jesus was who he said he was and that what he was offering was really for her. Going to the village was child's play after she crossed that bridge. She'd had too many broken promises. She'd she'd had too many untrustworthy words. She'd had too many men lie to her. She'd never met anyone like him. And neither have we. He is who he says he is. She said, there's there's one that's coming, and he's going to be the Christ, the anointed one, and he's the Messiah. Jesus took this opportunity to say what he said to very few others. He said to her, I am him. You might have came here today saying, who in the world can I turn to? How can this hurt be healed? How can my life be changed? And this thing that's being said from that stage right now, I sure want to believe it. But is it true? Let me just say what Jesus said. I am the way the truth, and the life. If you want to come to the Father, I invite you to come through me. He is who he says he is. His name is Jesus, translated into Hebrew, Aramaic is Yeshua, translated and defined, it means Savior. It's who. He is. You can trust that. So if you'd bow your heads with me today, I want to invite you to return to the well. Not Jacob's well. That's a literal geographical place. I want to encourage you to return to the well of love that can be found through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I've ever been forgiven of my sins, but I sure want to be. I don't know this Jesus, but I want to know him more. Or maybe you would say, I think I knew him once, but I sure don't serve him now. 
if that's you today and you'd like to receive this love that I'm talking about, would you just lift your hand where you're at? Because I want to know who you are so I can pray with you. Is there anybody here? Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Just lift, Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Anyone else today? Don't delay. Yes, yes, amen. Anyone else? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can place your hands down. Praise the Lord. It's the most, it, most important thing you'll ever do is to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Confess it with your mouth. The Bible says you shall be saved and that the love of God will fill your heart, fill your life. His Spirit will invade your, your life, change you forever, redirect your destiny. Here's what we're going to do together. If you raised your hand, even if you did not, I want us all to pray this prayer together. If you raised your hand, even if you did not, if you'll pray this prayer in belief and faith, inviting Christ to come and forgive you of your sins, I believe that he will. And your life will be changed today. Let's pray together. Repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I come before you today. I come before you today. Broken. Broken. And in need of healing. And in need of healing. I come before you today. I come before you today. Having sinned. Having sinned. And needing your forgiveness. I believe, today I believe today that you're the son of the living God, that you died for my sins, and that you rose again that I might have life. I ask you now, I ask you now to, forgive me of my sins, to forgive me of my sins, and Lord, to be my Lord, to be my Lord. and help me, and help me from, this day forward from this day forward to live for you. To live for you. Fill my life with your presence. Empower me with your spirit. Empower me with your spirit. That I might serve you all the days of my life. That I might serve you all the days of my life. In your name I pray, Jesus. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 I'm going to invite the prayer teams to come and stand around these altars. In just a few moments, I'm going to give another invitation. I'm going to give an invitation to those of you who need a fresh touch of the love of God. If you accepted Christ as a part of that prayer, I want you to come as a part of this second invitation and let someone pray for you and tell them that you accepted Christ and they can help you to get started on the right path. But I want to invite others of you here today who would say, you know, as you're preaching today, Pastor, the Lord really was drawing on my spirit and I realized I need a fresh outpouring of the love of God in my life. I felt ashamed or I felt beaten down or I felt wounded or I felt bruised. I felt weak and I need the love of God to come and to change some things in my life today. In just a moment, I ask everybody, and, and when everybody stands, if you would like to respond to that, to, that, to that invitation and have somebody pray for you, as we stand, I want you to get out from where you are and come forward and let these folks pray for you. And if you accepted Christ, I want you to come as well. So would you stand to your feet right now, and as this worship team begins to sing, if you need prayer, you need an outpouring of the love of God in your life, don't leave this place, but come forward. Come forward right now and let the Holy Spirit begin to minister to you. Come on now. Come on now. There are many that need to respond. There are many that need to respond. Come forward. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh. Come quickly. It's not too late. If you feel the Holy Spirit leading you, come on forward. These folks are here to pray for you. They love you and they want to share the love of Jesus with you. Go ahead and come on forward. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lift your hands and sing. Yeah, he loves us. Thank you for your love. We thank you for your love, Lord Jesus. Good at a ceremony, Kosura Manda Kasai. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah to your name. While these are praying, if you would just bow your heads with me right now, I want to pray for you. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. For these that have come down here, that you would pour your love out into their lives in such a powerful way. Transform them today and transform and redirect their destiny. 
And I pray for everyone else that's gathered in this place today and those that are listening online. I pray that this very moment, a fresh revelation of the love of God would fill their hearts and minds. And Lord, where there is woundedness, I pray healing would come. Lord, where there is weakness, I pray strength would come. Lord, where there is shame, I pray confidence would come. Lord, where there is rejection, I pray that acceptance would come. Lord, I pray where there has been prejudice, Lord, there will be acceptance. In Jesus' name, I pray your love be poured out upon these people. And Lord, not only upon these people, but through them, I pray you would love this community, that you would love this city, and God, you would expand the influence of your kingdom here in Huntsville and the surrounding area. Lord, we ask it in the name of Jesus today. We ask it in the name of Jesus today, the lover of our souls. Amen. Amen.